Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program 2 video and today I am very excited to showcase this craft here. It's like a miniature space shuttle that lands on the Mun and of course returns to Kerbin. I was inspired to make this craft when I saw a Reddit post by user Sapais uh, a while ago actually. They uploaded like a little gif to the Kerbal Space Program subreddit showing a miniature space shuttle going from Kerbin to the Mun. And I just remembered the really creative use of using the rover module as the cockpit for the space shuttle. So I thought I would like to make a miniature space shuttle that goes to the man using that cockpit and I purposefully didn't look back at that video because I didn't want to accidentally plagiarize the entire design. So I went in to design mine purely just remembering that Sapias had used the rover cockpit as the shuttle cockpit. So any similarities after that are purely coincidental. But if you want to check out the original post, I mean I just kind of showed a clip of it on screen, but I'll leave a link to the original Reddit post in the description of this video if you'd like to check it out, give a little upvote, etc, etc. But actually my space shuttle is coming along rather well. Right this second it's sort of in bits because I couldn't access the little wrench icon that lets you modify the properties of the wings. Uh, I kept on just grabbing a fuel tank and I did the same thing happened for the tail fin. So I had to offset it away from the ship in order to, you know, set the wing properties to what I wanted them to be and then I had to offset it back into the plane. I don't know if this is just something that's new to patch 4 or if it's just something I've always managed to avoid up until now for whatever reason or if it's something to do with the fact that I've kind of scaled down the UI. We weren't always able to change the UI scale in KSP2. It was only a recent patch that allowed that and I've since changed the scale because I play at 4K so the original scale was not great. Maybe it's something to do with that. Not sure. Could be a whole list of things. If you have this problem let me know in the comments section down below but yeah as you can see the actual structure of the plane is now complete. Just a question of painting it, the most important step in any Kerbal Space Program 2 craft construction, and then we can get on to building the rest of the rocket, and it's going to be a space shuttle style build. I briefly considered doing something like a dinosaur style launcher, or like a Lunex style mission, but I've done both of those things in Kerbal Space Program 1, and again, I'm sort of paying homage to Sapias' build, so it's going to be a space shuttle style launch. Uh, not quite true to the NASA space shuttle, because obviously first of all, Look at it, you know? Uh, but secondly, it's not going to have just the shuttle's engines and two SRBs. The space shuttle's only got two aero spike engines, which are not going to provide enough thrust rate ratio to get us off the launch pad. So in addition to the space shuttle's main engines and the two solid rocket motors, we're also going to put some engines on the external fuel tank. I initially decided to go with the mainsail engine, which you can see I've just placed there, but I then changed that up for some vector engines because uh, the space shuttle, any space shuttle really, is a fairly difficult beast to fly because of the imbalance of the payloads. You've got all these different engines firing at different points on the vehicle and aerodynamically it's just bad. So having the increased gimbal control that the vector engines offer over the mainsail engine well, that was a property that I kind of wanted. And here you can see me placing them here. I went with three vector engines. Not for any particular reason, I just felt three looked like a it's a magic number, right? And uh, then we can just get to doing like the little little finishing touches like adding the Separatron SRBs to the main solid rocket motors and adding all the struts, fuel lines, launch clamps, etc. But yeah, closing thoughts on the build. This is a fun old craft to construct actually. I mean, building space shuttles is usually quite fun anyway, but you always feel a little bit restricted because of the fact that you kind of have to emulate the style of the Buran or the American space shuttle. I like really kind of more unique shuttles like this. It was a Fun old thing to try, so thanks Surprise for figuring out that you could use this rover cockpit uh, for a space plane. And oh, here we are, here we are launching. So yeah, this thing absolutely screams off the pad, it's got very very good thrust weight ratio. So the first part of the flight, we're going to go straight up to about a kilometre off the ground and then we're going to start gradually letting this tip over using a bit of WASD, you know, the SAS controls, but also just throttling down the shuttle main engines and the external fuel tank main engines just so that the centre of thrust is more towards those SRBs so they can help naturally push us over. And we're following a similar flight plan to the NASA Space Shuttle in that we're launching inverted. You know, the Space Shuttle is rolling over on its back with the tank on top. But now 
we're going to deviate from that. We're going to flip over so that the space shuttle is now on top. This is because after detaching the solid rocket motors, this vehicle becomes a lot more unstable. But we can regain stability by flipping into this orientation here as we continue our way to space. It is still a little bit jerky and twitchy on the controls, but that's more due to the fact that we don't have any fine input. You know, we've only got W, A, S, and D. There's no analog joystick input to give us kind of more precise control. Uh, and obviously, if you press caps lock, so you have the fine control in this game, then the inputs just aren't quick enough and then, you know, you've got no control whatsoever. Now, once we get to a circular orbit, I'm not going to detach the external fuel tank. We're actually going to keep that attached until we're about halfway to the MUN. On its own, the space shuttle itself doesn't have enough delta V to perform uh, a journey from low Kerbin orbit to the MUN surface and back again. It's a little bit short, but that isn't the case if we continue using the fuel in the external fuel tank. And yes, I do say that despite the fact that I know the MUN shuttle does use part clipping for its fuel tank. So I guess technically it probably has a bit more delta V than it should. But I did design it first and foremost for its looks rather than its functionality. And I think, or at least I hope you agree that if you watch the build time lapse again, I don't think the part clipping, especially the fuel tank part clipping, I don't think it's that bad. And another thing to consider is that there are four nose cones on the space shuttle, including two rather large ones, which in theory could house more fuel it's just the in-game parts themselves don't have fuel in them and I guess the wings could have fuel in them as well so really there are lots of places that extra fuel could be stored on this thing so I don't really feel all that guilty about the park clipping oh hey one thing I should mention actually is this is my first time playing Kerbal Space Program 2 patch 4 you can probably tell because the nav ball has changed color that's one of the new features of KSP2 1.4 I think it is uh, you got the nav ball that changes color when you get to space so that's cool and I guess there's like some performance tweaks I have noticed that the parts manager seems to load up a lot faster I guess this is a relatively small craft compared to some of the ones I've launched on this channel in the past but I never really noticed a significant lag opening the parts manager so hopefully that's a positive sign that the parts manager is becoming quicker and quicker to use and that annoying freeze that happens when you right click something is going to become a thing of the past. Speaking of becoming a thing of the past that's just what happened to the external fuel tank it has now exhausted all of its fuel so now we can dump it and continue on just using the onboard fuel of the space shuttle it's Itself. Now I know what you're thinking, Matt, you've left debris in Kerbin orbit, think of the solar bears. Because uh, normally, you know, traditionally, I should say on this channel, I always try and make sure debris either impacts another celestial body or, you know, is dumped before we reach a circular Kerbin orbit so that it ends up going into the atmosphere. And what I'm trying to say is I don't leave debris floating around in space. But don't worry, guys, because although we've had patch 4, uh, orbital decay, it still exists in KSP2. So the debris will eventually leave space and enter Kerbin's atmosphere just because its orbit will inevitably decay. But as you can see, the space shuttle is now in circular MUN orbit and we have 1,750 meters per second of delta V remaining, which is just enough to form our MUN landing and, you know, MUN ascent and then return to Kerbin. Uh, MUN landings take around 580 meters per second. I usually budget 700 so I can, you know, plan for things like needing to adjust my landing zone, like I'm about to land and it's actually on the edge of a crater. Not ideal, so I can make an adjustment. So I guess, you know, you want to be budgeting 1,400 meters per second for the Muna Descent and then Muna Ascent. So I guess we are cutting things somewhat fine. But, I mean, I would be publishing this video if I didn't manage to get back to Kerbin, right? That would be a bit rubbish. Matt Lown, seasoned Kerbal Space Program veteran, uh, fails to land on the Mun and return. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time I've done that. In fact, I've had to strand a Kerbal on the Mun fairly recently, like two or three weeks ago, I had to strand a Kerbal on the Mun because, well, you know, actually it wasn't my fault at all. And to my credit, the lander got back to orbit, uh, just the Kerbal didn't because when I was building the craft, uh, the game auto-populated one of the command pods with an extra Kerbal, which meant that my return module didn't have enough seats. So I was like, oh, I'll leave him on the Mun and I'll go and rescue him later. And that was three weeks ago and I just completely forgot. So hey, write in the comments below what sort of vehicle should I use to rescue Bill Kerman who's stranded on the Mun. I might not do it next week because I don't want to just do I like I don't like having back to back videos of a similar sort of thing. So if I make a Juno video, for example, I don't really want the following week's video to also be going to Juno if that makes sense. So next week almost certainly won't be another Mun mission. But maybe like, you know, two or three weeks later we could have another crack at it and uh, maybe I'll send like a rover I mean one of my most popular videos on this channel is me sending an ambulance to the Mun to go and rescue a 
uh, in air quotes, injured Kerbal in KSP1. Maybe something silly and fun like that. So if you've got any ideas, uh, leave it in the comments down below. And of course, hey, while you're down there, leave a little like for our Kerbals that are now all on EVA. I'm sure they would very much appreciate the like. And, oh, we're going to crossfade. There we are. There's the money shot of the Kerbals all out on EVA. Still got that bug where we got with the flag changed. That's not my space agency's flag. I'm not using the custom flags mod anymore because it just never seems to work. I'm, but I'm using one of the stock flags, but that didn't show up. It's just defaulted to the KSP flag. So clearly that's a bug that still needs to be ironed out. Another annoying thing you can see, every time I board my space shuttle, the brakes, which, which were toggled on, they toggled off. So every time a Kerbal gets aboard, I have to quickly press the brake button again just to stop the space plane from rolling down this hillside. Which I landed on being all clever, like, oh, I can use the natural curvature of the hill as a natural sort of takeoff ramp. But of course, that's pointing on the 270 degree vector, which is not as efficient as the 90 degree vector. Launching at 270 degrees, we're launching against the moon's rotation, so it ends up costing a little bit more delta V than if we were to launch along the 90 degree vector, which is with the moon's rotation. So that gives us a little bit of an extra push to get to orbit. So I spun around, I'm going to activate RCS, which will activate those two front Werner engines and kick us up. Oh, there we are. And beautifully done if I do say so myself kind of all uh, self congratulatory there but yeah it's just gonna be a nice easy cruise to get back to Mun orbit I think I aimed for 20 kilometers above the Mun surface just because that just I just seemed like a nice good round number to aim for and there we are that's our apparatus is there 21 and a half thousand meters so not far off my target and then we can just cruise on up and perform our circularization burn. I really hope at some point someone invents a better time warp mod for KSP2 because I hate the fact that the time warp is kind of locked the closer you are to the surface of the MUN. Like you're locked to just the first three arrows of the time warp gauge. You have to wait till you're a bit higher up before you can use the faster time warps, which has always been really annoying. And it's not even that bad on the MUN, but on places like Gilly and Bop and even like Minmus to an extent, it's really painful because ascending and descending takes ages because of the low gravity. And so you're stuck with really low time warp options for a long time to the point where I'm getting my phone out and just browsing like Twitter or sorry, X, sorry, <laughs> whilst I wait for my spacecraft to painfully move far enough away from the surface of the celestial object for me to actually start initiating some faster amounts of time warp and get on with my life. <laughs> anyway, that wasn't really too much of a problem with the MUN because the MUN has relatively high uh, surface gravity. And we performed our move Moon escape burn. I cancelled the maneuver node at the last second just so I could perform the final bit by eye because I wanted a very precise periapsis. I wanted it to be low enough so that it was inside Kerbin's atmosphere so that we could indeed capture around Kerbin, but also not too low because I want to land back at the Kerbal Space Center. So my objective was just to start bleeding off my apogee and bringing it down so I could more easily set up my final re-entry so that we'd be heading back to the Kerbal Space Center. Now, my initial plan was to not use any burns from the aero spikes for any point in the mission now, you know, for the rest of the trip. And I managed it. I didn't do any burns. I didn't do any final retrograde burns. I managed to precisely control my descent using kind of careful aero brake passes, lowering my apoapsis until I was on a course that took me directly over the Kerbal Space Center. But then it came to editing the video. I loaded in all of my captured footage only to realize that it all cut off shortly after my Moonar ascent. And upon closer inspection, it's because the hard drive that, you know, Nvidia Shadow Plays stores to had run out of storage space. And so the recording just cut off. So I was like, oh. So I had to go back and refilm the entire mission from the Moonar ascent. Which, you know, wasn't ideal, <laughs> and it was further troubled by the fact that it's very warm in the UK right now. I know this is kind of a bit of a recurring theme for me on this channel, but, you know, I have to record these things in a very small box room that's all insulated with, you know, soundproofing foam. And we're not just getting warm weather in the UK right now, we have a Amber Alert Met office, you know, like a government office warning for like a proper heat wave. Uh, today, for me, I live in the southwest as well, which is the hottest part of the country. I think we hit 25 degrees Celsius, which I know the Americans watching isn't that big of a deal, but we have air conditioning here. We have like double glazed windows. Our, basically, our houses are designed to retain as much heat as possible. Plus, we're not really used to that kind of heat. And as I mentioned, I'm in a small box room. I've got to keep the door closed whilst I'm doing my commentaries. My PC 
kicks out a lot of heat. It's an RTX 4090 and a lot of other big, powerful, beefy components that all output loads of heat. And I've got two big 4K monitors which get really hot as well. So basically, guys, I'm dying. I'm sweltering. I've been necking water all day long. And I was getting to the point where I was just frustrated. Like, oh, I got to do this, uh, these air passes again and I can't quite get the space center lined up. You know what? I'm going to do a little cheeky retrograde burn just here, just to kind of force an encounter with the Kerbal Space Center. Now, it was a very small burn. You know, I think it was like less than 50 meters per second. So I feel like it's it's like kind of realistic. It's not that egregious. Just a shame I couldn't just rely on the atmosphere alone. Since, you know, I swear, guys, that's what I managed to do the first time I filmed this mission. Oh, well, you know, maybe next time, eh? It's not like my approach to the Kerbal Space Center was even very good this time with that retrograde burn. I'm having to come in very, very high, very fast. I'm doing a bit of a extreme air break just there. And there, uh, there's the runway looming ahead. So I guess, do I have any closing thoughts for this mission? Uh, very warm. I mean, I, I don't know how, like, coherent I sound in this commentary. So if it sounds like I'm drunk or, like, exhausted or something, it's because I'm recording this commentary in what can be essentially described as a sauna. But it's all gonna be over soon, so it's all okay. We can deploy our landing gear, line ourselves up on the runway for our final approach, and ultimately our touchdown, and thus, wait for it, there we are. Thus concludes my first mission in Kerbal Space Program. Is it Kerbal Space Program 1.4? Like, patch 4, whatever it is. My first mission in Kerbal Space Program 2 with Patch 4 installed. And I don't know, I mean, I feel like it's, uh, I haven't really experienced any big bad bugs or anything. And performance has been pretty good, but again, you know, this was a fairly small and simple craft. And my PC is usually able to sort of brute force its way through a lot of Kerbal Space Program 2's performance issues. But, all that aside, we've arrived home, which of course means that the video and the mission are over. Big thanks to the names that are now scrolling on the left of the screen. They're my YouTube channel members and my Patreon supporters, and they make all of this content possible. And speaking of content, there's two videos from my channel on screen that you should think you'll like. Hopefully they're good picks. But yeah, did you guys enjoy this mission? I certainly had a lot of fun doing it. I always enjoy kind of designing the more quirky style space planes. So yeah, that's about it from me. Thanks for watching once again, and I'll see you in the next one.